Hello, everybody. My name is Jason Roberts. Uh, thank you, Anna, for the introduction. Thank you uh, uh, for giving me this opportunity to speak in the beautiful city of Freiburg. Um, so I'm just going to talk a little bit, uh, less empirical maybe than some of the presentations you've heard, more practical um, about our experiences of implementing a reporting uh, guideline policy. Um, I'm going to take up um, Doug's challenge. I'm going to suggest a couple of uh, uh, things that all of us should try and do uh, collectively, not just at a journal level. And if I sometimes refer to you as you, I'm imagining you as all editors-in-chief or, or something like that, and I know you're not. Um, but uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about our experiences and try and relate it to... How does this... Here we go. Okay. Um, so, first of all, Headache is a uh, pretty small journal. It's about 400 submissions a year. Um, it's a very middle-ranked title. It's a subspecialty journal within the field of neurology. Um, we decided in 2008 that we were going to launch a reporting guideline policy. And um, some of this data might, uh, is, is actually quite old now. We conducted this back in 2008, 2009. We actually looked at all, at the time, 435 consult endorsing journals to see what they did. And at about 45% in their instructions for authors, at least, seemed to indicate that they wanted to, a mandatory submission. And that's what we decided we would do. Um, we, uh, I, I will say as an aside, I haven't really got uh, uh, a lot of data on this, but I work on another journal and we adopted a, a suggestive approach and our take-up rate's been pretty much non-existent, so it's, it seems that you do need the dental pliers approach to this. Um, okay, so um, what we do is we, we, we provide in, in, in our instructions for authors what, uh, what we want uh, from our authors. We want them to supply a reporting checklist. Also on our manuscript central submission system, um, you are asked a question right at the start, what type of study is this? And then at the end of the submission process, we actually give them the appropriate checklist. So rather than sending them to consort uh, website or to the Strobe website or whatever, we actually provide the, uh, the document uh, itself, so they can download it, fill it out, upload it. Um, the, uh, and I'll talk about the uh, pushback we've had on that in a minute. Uh, so we, uh, we decided as well that we were going to adopt seven guidelines. They were Consort, Prisma, Moose, Strobe, Stard, Squire, and Corec. We noticed that 63% of the journals at the time when we conducted this survey asked for more than just consort. If they asked for consort, they asked for something else. We thought that was wise. We also devised two of our own. We also devised one for non-pharmacological uh, trials in headache medicine, and also one uh, for case reports as well. It's a very simple uh, uh, um, uh, guideline for case reports. Okay. There we go. So we actually have a poster, if they can find somewhere to hang it, where you can actually look at some of these points in, in more detail. But uh, I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about, about barriers, which I define as being uh, philosophical or perception-based behaviors that are not helpful, okay? Um, and uh, essentially, what, what I found when I tried to launch this is that I first of all had to overcome apathy. Um, you know, my editors care about the, the journal, but they did not recognize that, this, that reporting, uh, uh, there were reporting problems. And those that did, and there were one or two, did not really recognize the scale of the problem. And so it took a lot of work on my part to try and come up with um, the information. And the information is out there, but um, trying to find it. And this was, this was even before Equator. So, you know, Equator's done a lot to try and pull all that information together. Um, then, uh, once we'd sort of agreed that we were going to do this, um, I then had to uh, uh, still convince some of the powerful personalities. And this is a problem that affects smaller journals. It's, it's all well and good, you know, uh, I, mean, I think BMJ and JAMA and all of those journals can probably impose this because everyone wants to publish in those journals. It's much harder when you get to a smaller level journal and small societies where politics reigns. And probably one of the uh, three most prominent headache uh, research specialists in the world right in front of the entire uh, board of directors uh, said to me that if we imposed reporting, uh, reporting guideline checklists, we were simply going to make the journal boring and that every paper would look the same. Um, so we have to overcome bias like that before we could really move ahead. Um, luckily, I had a couple of powerful voices in the room to back me up. So, okay, so then we got to over the apathy, then we got inertia, and inertia, th there is a very valid reason for this. It, it's, a, it's a fear of sticking your neck out. If you're in a small field, you don't necessarily want to be the first to do this. And, of course, the accusation was, we are going to create a lot of extra work for the authors. They're going to go to one of our rival titles. Um, so there's a couple of ways that you can overcome that. 
Um, one is you have to think very carefully about the steps that you implement um, in your submission system and in your instructions. Make it very clear so that the authors understand why they're doing it um, and that there's a value to it. I'm not saying that I've succeeded, as some of my data will show in another slide. Um, the, another thing that you might want to look to try and do is team up with other journals in the field. All three uh, headache journals now um, actually uh, mandatorily ask for consort. That wasn't the case when we started. So now if you want to publish a randomized controlled trial in, in this particular field, you have to do it. That has been a tremendous help for us by going out and, and working with our competitor journals. And they were certainly open to it. Um, my suggestion is then that uh, if you can overcome this inertia that what you need to do is uh, to convince people that this is a, is a good exercise to do is a risk reward analysis. So look at what the potential risks are. Are authors going to def defect? Are you adding a lot of extra time to the submission process? Um, I, I will say anecdotally we've never heard any complaint that um, they, they've decided that they're going to publish elsewhere. I do hear some people complain that it takes a lot to submit. Um, so that's something to think about. Um, you, so I think your approach to implementation therefore needs to consider a couple of things and, and it has to be both philosophical and practical. Philosophically you have to think about what it is that you want to do and why you want to do it and then this is the critical bit, don't uh, skimp on thinking about the practical things. How are you going to collect this information? How are you going to enforce it when you do get that information? Um, or get partial amounts of that information. Um, so anyway, I, I will just say that I have got an, an eight-step guide which I will be handing out at the poster on how I think journals should go about doing this. And I, this is my first point that I want to make for a, 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 something that we all need to do to move forward uh, to speed up the process of uh, widespread adoption is I think there needs to be a templated approach to this which we just heard suggested. And I think simple resources need to be put together in a toolkit or something like that which a journal can just take with, uh, you, know, to, uh, you know, managing editors like myself can take it to the editor and say, look, here's the discussion that's going on. This is the data on how serious it is. Um, and um, here are some steps on how we can go about implementing this. I think we have to put pretty much all these things in, uh, you know, in people's laps, really, because it, it was a lot of work on my part to research this. Uh, most journals don't have that luxury. So I also just want to talk briefly about confounders. Now, confounders I, I classify as different from barriers. Barriers, I think that's kind of willful behavior. Confounders I see as more sort of uh, um, uh, you know, practical problems and, and mostly a problem of comprehension, okay? Um, I think certainly um, with smaller journals, one of the things that you will find is, uh, is that we are dealing with a lot of uh, inexperienced authors, first time authors. Um, and you have to try and overcome that. Now, as a journal, what we've tried to do is we've, we've actually put out some educational resources. We're just about to do a video, as we just saw an example of. Um, we have made a conscious effort to go out and train the residents and fellows. One of the things that we do is we, we've set up something called an article review club where over Skype, every two weeks, we get all the 13 fellows there are in headache medicine in the US and ask them to uh, participate where we give them a live manuscript to review. And then um, one of them writes up the review, and it's actually a review that we use in the journal. Um, it's uh, the wisdom of the crowd approach that we heard about this morning a little bit. And I think that uh, that's, learning, uh, that's teaching how to deconstruct a paper, but at the same time learning how to construct a paper. Um, so you, yeah, so it is investing in the next generation. I think um, one of the other um, uh, confounders is simply that, um, and certainly this is a problem for headache, is that we get a lot of authors that they're, they're, they're first time authors to us. And they are often, this submission that we receive is often the only submission we'll ever receive. And uh, you know, that's probably because you know, we're not the highest ranked journal that there is out there. So you know, we're probably getting rejected papers or people are shopping their papers around. Um, and so, um, you know, they simply have not really comprehended what it is that we're asking them to do. Of course, they could read the instructions for authors, but as the old adage goes in publishing, if you want to keep a secret, publish it in the instructions for authors. So. And then there are things like language barriers. Now, this is, the, this is where I want to differentiate what's already been done, which I think is great, but what needs to happen is that it is wonderful that documents like Consort have been translated into several languages. What we need to do is actually translate some of this other material, such as 
why this is important that we're asking you to do this. Um, here's some data why. You know, we've got these studies that are out there, but I think you just need to summarize it in a two-page document or something like that that every journal could put up there on its website um, or could send out with, um, you know, your submission confirmation email. You can just automatically append it and say, look, if you forgot to include this, you know, yeah, we, we will happily send the paper back to you if you want to take account of this information. I think that is something that needs to happen uh, because as the data on my next slide shows you, I definitely think that there's a language issue. Um, then some of the, uh, we also find that we receive incomplete forms or the wrong forms. The incomplete forms, me, uh, by that I mean, you know, we might get on the consort checklist, somebody has put N, A, not applicable, or they've written yes, no, when we're actually looking for the page number. That's what, that's what the, the document's about. So uh, clearly they've not understood what we're asking. If they've used the wrong uh, checklist, again, it strikes us as probably, uh, you know, lack of comprehension. Um, you know, it could be equally that their paper is really hard to, to pigeonhole into one of the particular categories that we have checklists for. Um, and then there's a perception, a misperception, that all we're asking them to do is actually fill out the reporting guideline checklist. And so they'll fill that out, but then they make no reference to any of the criteria in their paper itself. <laughs> so that's deeply frustrating. So what you have to do, uh, and what we do at an enforcement level, is we actually ask for the, that information to be included uh, if we send it out, if we send the paper out for review and it goes back out for revision. Now, not many papers actually make it that far. Um, we act, like I said, we have a mandatory uh, a submission part of the process in our manuscript central system. However, some crafty devils have figured out that you can get around this. What you do is you're supposed to upload a manuscript type that says checklist, and you therefore upload the checklist we provided. Instead, 12% of authors have figured out that if you upload the manuscript itself and call it a checklist, you can get around um, uploading the checklist. Um, so I will say, though, that... Um, that, uh, as, as that number at the bottom says, that 78% of those papers are actually rejected anyway. And I think there's some significance in that. We don't reject because they failed to s include that checklist. And indeed, what I do is, because I, I, I know that figure is so high, I don't even enforce it on initial submission. Uh, if we get that to the point of revision, then I enforce it. Okay, so um, one of the things that we did find is that, um, is that 62% of the authors were new to the journal. They clearly had not read the instructions. They weren't aware of what we were asking them to do. And, and rather worryingly, 81% are from the non-English speaking um, uh, countries, whereas our typical rate of submission from non-English speaking countries is 58%. So clearly, we as a journal have got to do more. We are going to look into translating our instructions, um, not just the, uh, the guidelines themselves. So we feel that there are probably four reasons behind this, uh, why, why these authors fail to adhere. We think there's a lack of understanding. We think that there is a lack of awareness in our policies, that then, to be honest, not really even interested in, in the journal. They're just looking for a place to get published quickly. Or fourthly, uh, we, we actually think that they possibly know that there's defects in the paper, and they know that if they fill out this document that it's going to show that there's defects in the paper, and they're hoping that if they don't do it, and we won't police it, that they'll actually get away with it. Um, well, they're wrong. Very, very quickly, because I know I'm running out of time here and probably all want coffee. Um, so um, what has been our uptake um, uh, amongst our editorial board? What is their thoughts on this? It's critical that you have buying from your editorial board, because if they're not enforcing the standards uniformly, then uh, your, your peer review is it becomes a crapshoot, basically. You know, you can get some, one person that's very rigid, another person that lets something sail through. And that's not acceptable. So we actually surveyed for this, uh, uh, um, for this presentation, we actually surveyed the editorial board. And um, I, I was pleased to see that 80% of them actually use the checklist as part of their decision-making process. And I included a quote there. It says, I check because it is a strong predictor of quality. And um, actually, most of the board actually said that, not quite as uh, briefly and as eloquently as that. But it, um, I think that's really important. Um, then we were disappointed uh, with the results that we got back from the editorial board that they, 50, only 53% of them actually thought that the review was really useful. And we do actually provide this with the manuscript. We provide the filled out you know, uh, consult statement or whatever. Um, so clearly we've got to work harder with the reviewers. We weren't expecting them to necessarily do all the checking for us, but we thought that it might inspire them um, you know, to make certain comments that that hasn't really happened. Um, 93% definitely feel that since we've implemented this in, in uh, the start of 2009 that we've had improvements, although, you know, I'm not, I can't say that's a direct correlation, that might have just happened anyway. 
Um, but I do want to touch on a couple of these comments right at the bottom um, that um, authors may understand the, the actual concepts and the criteria of these research and guidelines, but they still don't understand why we're asking them to do this. And that, I think, is the critical barrier um, for widespread adoption. I mean, if you can't even convince some of the editors about this, what hope have you got with authors? So it, it, it's going to have to be not just the journals. I think you have to go right back to the, early, you know, the earliest parts of the medical education process. This needs to be a part of that instruction. And we're doing our little bit by instructing our residents and fellows, or junior doctors, as you will. Okay, very briefly, um, we are, I haven't got the empirical data that others have, we are looking into some of the effects of this. We've applied to get a grant, which hopefully we will receive to study this with, in association with another journal, Tim Hool, who is here. Uh, Tim, can you put your hand up? He's our statistical uh, consultant for, for this journal and another journal, anesthesiology. We're hoping that we can uh, study the effect of implementation of these guidelines. One little simple analysis we did was we have looked to see um, has there been an uptake in uh, people actually just state what type of, uh, um, if it's a randomized controlled trial in their titles, and we are seeing an uptick. Um, so finally, overcoming barriers. Th this, these are my, these are my, this is my clarion call, my final slide as to things that I think need to happen. Um, I think all of us here need to work with publishers. I, I think the, the COPE model, uh, the Committee of Publication Ethics, is an interesting one to look at. Um, I myself was the, uh, I'm the past president of the International Society of Managing Technical Editors. I've probably seen inside more editorial offices than just about anyone out there. And I can tell you that COPE has permeated most offices now. And one of the reasons for that is that the publishers have got on board with COPE and um, you know, they, they provide membership to COPE for their journals. Um, I know Wiley Blackwell and I know Elsevier have provided documents on publication ethics. I think we need them to do something like that here because they, they're the ones that can reach out to, uh, right there, that's 4,000 journals across those two publishers. They're the ones that can reach right into the editorial office and, um, and they do have a lot of power, even with the journals they don't own, um, to try and um, you know, push this forward. Like I said earlier, I think we need a toolkit that, uh, that can be sent out to editorial offices. This is an issue that you need to think about. Here are the steps to go about implementing a policy if you want to do that. Um, and also, we just need to find ways to encourage grassroots collaboration between journals. Headache medicine is a very small field. There's really only three journals. That was very easy to do. I think that actually is a huge way to get, uh, um, rather than just saying 3,000 journals, Elsevier journals are all going to start doing this, you might need to work at the subspecialty level and work your way up. I think that is going to lead to a success. And, uh, and also, we do need to just think about who the constituent parties are in this. It's not just editors-in-chief. I want to make a, a plea for managing editors and executive editors as well in editorial offices. They have a lot of power, and they may have some time to actually implement this rather than the busy uh, clinician edit editor-in-chief. So work with organizations such as the International Society of Managing Technical Editors, the Council of Science Editors, the European Association of Science Editors. These are all important organizations I think that can contribute. And finally, if anyone can f um, uh, prove that there is a direct correlation between an improvement in citations and implementation of these reporting guidelines, you've achieved the holy grail, okay? Thank you.